Hello and welcome to the online service from Nambour Anglican Parish, South East Queensland, Australia. My name is Ralph Bowles. I'm the priest in charge of this parish in the Anglican Church, Southern Queensland. This service is a brief explanation of the Christian gospel, a brief act of worship, and we pray that in listening to it and watching it, you will find encouragement in your search for God, if you're searching for God, or in your relationship with God, if you want to express faith and hope. Here is a verse from the Apostle John to open our service today. From 1 John chapter 1. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you, God is light, in him there is no darkness at all. May God bless you today as you join your spirit with God's spirit in worship and fellowship. In the year 1990, the Anglican Church in South Africa created a new diocese. It was the dying days of apartheid and the new diocese covered an area that looked something like a war zone. You might remember some of the names of the places where the most horrendous barbaric crimes were committed. Sharpville was one such place. Ten years earlier, 69 people were killed and over 180 injured. They were shot by the South African police, mostly in the back as they were running away. Sharpville and massacre are words that go together in people's minds to this day. The Sharpville Massacre. The new diocese was called the Diocese of Christ the King. The new bishop, Peter Lee, chose to be enthroned, although he didn't use that term, in Sharpville. Why? Why Christ the King and why Sharpville? Today the church throughout the world celebrates the feast of Christ the King. We proclaim that Christ is Lord of the whole creation, King over every time and every people and every place. And yet in today's Gospel reading, the figure of Christ looks about as far from being a King as it's possible to get. Here, Jesus is under arrest and summoned before Pontius Pilate. He's there because his own people are trying to get rid of him, eliminate him, have him crucified. They invent charges against him in the hope that Pilate will order his death and rid them of their problem. They say Jesus claimed to be king and therefore didn't accept Pilate's authority and posed some kind of threat to the Roman occupiers. Pilate finds no evidence against Jesus, but is too weak to stand up to the Jewish leaders, so they have their way. Jesus is led away, flogged, <coughs> tortured, mocked, spat on, and eventually crucified and killed. Why then do we read this passage on the day when the church proclaims that Jesus is King? It doesn't look much like it from this text. Well, there are two reasons. First, we affirm that Christ is King Lord of the universe, 
in spite of all appearances to the contrary. When Jesus was crucified, it looked for all the world like defeat. His band of followers who had hoped for so much and hoped that he would be the one to free Israel from the crushing weight of oppression by the Roman occupiers, those followers had all their hopes dashed to pieces by the crucifixion. They watched what happened and then they turned away broken hearted, absolutely demoralised, crushed, abandoned, distraught, hopeless. But then God acted to lift the veil, to uncover the true meaning of the crucifixion, to reveal the truth. It was not defeat. It was actually the victory of love. It wasn't abandonment. It was the kind of love that nothing in the world can stop, not even death itself. It wasn't demoralised hopelessness, it was actually triumph for those who have the eyes to see. When God raised Jesus following the crucifixion, the cross was, the cross was cast in a whole new light. It was turned on its head, as it were. It meant the opposite of what it looked like at first. It wasn't evil conquering love, it was actually love conquering evil. The first reason that new diocese in South Africa was called Christ the King, and the reason the bishop's seat is in Sharpville, and the reason we read this account on the feast of Christ the King, is that they remind us Christ's kingdom is not of or from this world. Christ's followers are not involved in violent uprising against the Roman occupiers. No, Christ is king of an upside-down kind of world. His is a topsy-turvy kind of kingdom where things are not as they appear at first. Jesus is king of a kingdom in a strange back-to-front kind of way. He wears a crown, but it's a crown of thorns. He's raised up high on a throne, but the throne is a cross. He has subjects in his kingdoms, yes, but he calls those subjects friends, and he serves them rather than the other way around. He is almighty and all-powerful in his kingdom, yes, but he expresses his power by becoming least of all. And he demonstrates might by showing mercy and pity. His kingdom has its aristocrats, yes, but they are the poor, the humble, the lowly, the outcast, the despised. That's the first reason for this passage on this feast and for the Diocese of Christ the King and the Sea in Sharpville. The second reason is that Christ defies all that denies the truth of this kingdom and calls his friends to do the same. When Jesus goes willingly to the cross, it's an act of absolute defiance against the powers that would use violence and force to have their way in the world. The Prince of Peace submits himself to violence precisely to undermine it, to dispel it, to blow it away. Bishop Peter Lee did the same thing by taking his bishop's chair into Sharpville. 
violence and the threat of violence will not make us cowed and broken people. We are citizens of another kingdom with a very different king. Around the cross of Jesus, the apparent rules of the world, the ones with clout, scoff and sneer. If you are the Christ, they say, and the enforcers, the soldiers, do the same. If you were the king of the Jews. But the poor, the lowly, the humble, will soon be shown a deeper truth. Jesus is king. And rules in an unheard of kind of way. And calls his friends and followers to a new kind of citizenship in a profoundly different realm. This kind of citizenship was integral to the rebirth of the nation of South Africa. It was exemplified in its leaders in powerfully moving ways. Desmond Tutu won the Nobel Peace Prize. He chaired the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, which probably avoided civil war. It was critical in breaking the cycle of recrimination and revenge once the African National Congress took power. Tutu was once asked why he lived his life the way he did. And he said that once, as a little boy, he once saw a white man tip his hat to a black woman. A white man showing respect to a black woman was such an unusual thing in South Africa that in that simple gesture, Tutu saw an alternative way an alternative to the way things were in that nation. In that simple gesture, he saw the seeds of a whole new future for his country. That gesture stayed with Tutu all his life and it gave him a real sense of his vocation. The white man who tipped his hat was Trevor Huddleston, an Anglican priest, later to become a bishop himself. And the black woman was Desmond Tutu's mother. Nelson Mandela was another great South African leader. He was kept in prison on Robben Island for 27 years by the racist apartheid government. When he was finally released, he became the new South Africa's first president. Soon after his election, he was holding a meeting in the president's office with important high-level officials and national leaders planning the country's future. There was a knock at the door, the door opened, and in came a middle-aged black woman pushing a tea trolley loaded with tea and coffee and biscuits. Mandela stopped the meeting, asked all the important leaders in the room to stand, and said, I would like to introduce to you my colleague, Mrs. Kolotsu. And one by one, Tutu went around the room and introduced Mrs. Kolotsu to each of those leaders. Not the tea lady, but the president's colleague in the presidential office helping the new nation of South Africa to be born. That is what the upside-down, back-to-front, 
topsy-turvy kingdom in which Christ is king looks like. The lowliest, the most humble, are treated with dignity and respect. Every person's value is recognised, no matter what their role or status or position, because in fact there is only one status for every human being under the sun, and that is beloved child of God, created in the image of God. Well, think about the courage and perseverance of Mary MacKillop, Australia's first saint. She insisted on decent education for Australian children of poor families living in rural and isolated communities. Her work transformed the face of Australian education and indeed of the nation. Because of her convictions about the value of every child, she went into battle with bishops, suffered excommunication, and with no money at all, somehow got herself to Rome and convinced the Pope of the worth of what she was doing. He recognised her order of the Sisters of St Joseph, and many, many more schools were built for poor Australian kids. That's where you see Christ reigning. Christ reigns wherever each and every person is recognised as bearing the image of God, regardless of that person's level of ability or disability, no matter whether they're young or old, male or female, black or white, sick or healthy, rich or poor, educated or not. That's the bedrock of a just and caring society and indeed of the kingdom of God. Our vocation is to unveil Christ's reign where we live and as we interact with others. It's there, waiting to be seen. As the truth dawns that Christ is King and as his reign is seen more clearly, we will see too our world reconciled, healed, restored, renewed, and people and communities and nations made whole as God intends. In the meantime, we live at the foot of the cross in towns like Sharpville, but we are citizens of a different kingdom. Abiding in that kingdom is our contribution to its finally coming. The church is to be a community of citizens of that coming kingdom. And it will come because Christ is the firstborn, the first fruits, and the sure sign of what will finally be. Amen. May the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you what is pleasing in his sight, and the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace, filled with the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Christ. Amen.
Thank you for watching this video. We hope it's been of encouragement to you for your spiritual life. If you'd like what we produce here, please subscribe to this channel. That'll be a great help to our ministry. And if you want to support us financially uh, by a donation, you can do so in the link below this video. Uh, and that donation goes through our website. Thank you for watching again. And we pray that you'll be encouraged in your understanding and knowledge of God. So thank you very much for being with us.